So friends, I am at 49 Music Square West, and you can see that this is RFD TV. And I am meeting Diana Goodman from Hee Haw, Hee Haw Honey. They are filming the 50th anniversary today of Hee Haw here. And so we're gonna go see Diana. Stay tuned. Now I'm on the other side of the door. <laughs> Diana just came through. I'm waiting for the lady that came with her to let her in. Vincent, don't you? Yes. Would you mind? Oh, we're doing a cruise in 2020. Are you? Yeah, me and them. We call Red, White, and Blue Cruise. Mm -hmm. So were you playing? But were you playing? Thank you so much. Uh, you're Appreciate welcome. you. You're welcome. Yeah. So you're going out on a cruise, eh? Yeah, I hate cruise ships, but <laughs> <laughs> I really do. I get sick. But uh, they they want to do this. And I said, well, all right, it's cool. We're working together. Some we call it Red, White, and Bluegrass Tour. Oh, that yeah, that sounds great. cool. No limit. To that. Yeah, that's what that's what you need to hear. Yeah. You, I'm you. What? Oh. What are we you doing? Keep, you just stand where you are. He's... Yeah. Oh. Hey, Charlie. I'm looking for my name. That's, that's incredible. Atlanta. 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 Georgia. Yeah. And Georgia. Georgia. He's in Georgia. Thank you so much. Snuck in the group. <laughs> it's nice to meet you. You too. Oh, thank we'll, you. Yeah. Susan, will you take a picture? Would you mm -hmm. take a picture? I'll do both. 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 i and uh, I was on the show in 81 with my band. When did you start? 81. It was a group called The Shop. And we were on the same show as David and That's good. What is your name? Kevin Bailey. I'm Susan. Hi, Susan. Nice to meet you. What is your band name? It was The Shop back then. I played with Charlie. Okay, now. But it was The Shop. S H O P P E. Uh, Charlie McCoy was producing us. Okay. Yeah. So I think I just posted show. that video. Have no. you seen that show? Which show? The that one. particular one, yeah. Because I think I just put it on Facebook. Did you really? Because I remember David and uh, David. Brazil and Shelly. Uh -huh. and, um, I want to say Loretta was on it. Too. It's 1981. I believe that's the one I just, one I just okay. put up. Because I was trying to Maybe somebody will. find Maybe some. Maybe put up three or four. Five. I was five. trying to. Five. The one with Diane Sherrill. Yeah. I've known Diane forever. I didn't know she was on there. I think I just lost Charlie. We'll see you. Okay, bye. bye. Thank bye. you. See if any of them are in tune. Nope. 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 Not a one of them in tune. We already did his of Janie's on. Janie's yeah, Janie's on now. She's the last one. 
So let's do it to it. Okay. So friends, I have here Jana. Jana J. J. J A N A J A E. You got it. I got it. Okay. You got it. All right. So uh, Jana, you play fiddle. Right. I think you're well known for playing a blue fiddle. Blue fiddle, my magic blue hee-haw fiddle. Aha, uh -huh. so you played fiddle on hee-haw. Yes, I did. All right, so tell us about that. Tell us first how you got into playing. Oh, my parents got me into playing when I was just tiny. At, uh, they both were students at Juilliard. They were both graduates of Juilliard School of Music in New York City. And I was their first child. So they were going to have a child prodigy, you know. And actually, my first TV appearance was uh, Ted Mac Amateur Hour. When I was five years old, I played Hungarian dance number five. So that was pretty fun. And then uh, my folks were divorced after when I was about six. We went to live with my grandparents. My granddaddy was a champion fiddle player. And he taught me all those old fiddle tunes by ear and the dances, the shottish and the waltz and the polka and all that. So we had a great deal of fun, and they lived right close to the National Old Time Fiddle Contest, the big one, Weezer, Idaho. And gosh, I met people and learned different styles and bluegrass, everything. And I was still studying classically. So I had all this going on, and then uh, lived in Redding, California, and was teaching in the college there, the schools in the college, and um, Buck Owens came to town. He did two concerts at the college, and one of the guys in charge of the college program said, you know, you've got you to gotta come around and meet Buck. I said, well, I'm busy, and I've got this, that, and that. You've got to come. And he told Buck the same thing. He said, see you later, Lee. <laughs> we'll see <laughs> you. Did good. So uh, he convinced Buck that he had to meet this girl fiddle player, and he convinced me to come back to see Buck. And uh, they asked me to play on the second show, and I played Orange Blossom Special with Don Rich. And it was Don's last performance. Wow. So I had been staying in touch with Buck's manager, Jack McFadden, to book, book our bluegrass band. So when they called me, come to Bakersfield to audition, I thought they were talking about the bluegrass band. No, they wanted me to audition for Buck and the Buckaroos. So I stayed in a hotel for about a week. Jack said, do not go out of the room. No, no, for any reason at all, you order room service, I'll get you whatever you need. And I did have my tapes of Buck. I had every song of his, my reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder, and I mean, I learned every song for a week. And I had left my bluegrass band. They were playing in Sacramento. They weren't too happy that I was gone all that time, but Jack kept calling me every day, just wait, Buck's going to hear you. Huh, I was ready to bail, you know. And finally Jack called me that one morning, Saturday morning, I think, and he said, okay, get your things together, we're going to check you out, and Buck's going to hear you. I said, oh my gosh, I had things all over the room. And he said, I'll be there in 10 minutes. <laughs> I said, I can't find He said, you got to, I'll be there in 10 minutes. And then the audition was quite long, too. And long story short, I became the world's first Buckarette. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> yep. That's how it happened. And then Buck, you know, being in Buck's band all over the world, and he brought me to Hee Haw. So uh, Hee Haw was another, it was a milestone in my life because it brought, you know, brought us into America's families. And people watched every Saturday night. People would recognize me in the airports. And I was just amazed, you know. So many viewers watched that show. So it, it made, Hee Haw made careers for so many people, countless people. When did you start on Hee Haw? What year? Oh, I don't know what year it was. Was it the it was beginning of Hee Haw? When, was Buck there originally? Oh, no, no, no. I, I, was, I was later. Okay. I just did Hee Haw about the last five years. It so was the last five? Yeah. yeah. Very and, cool. uh uh, Buck, Buck uh, you know, really was a wonderful entertainer, knew how to engage an audience, would get me standing ovations every show, sometimes more than one. And um, so I learned a lot. I learned a lot about how to connect with the, because I knew I could play. I was confident of playing, but 
that entertaining part and connecting with an audience was it was pretty special. That's a learned skill. That's, and, yes. yes, ma'am. And so I feel like I learned from the best. And then, uh, you know, later on, uh, well, when Buck and I, you know, we were married. That's what I was going to ask you about. Yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, and we were very, very much in love. We just connected musically, and you know, he was wonderful to me. And um, but the marriage brought another set of problems, and we we tried got there, but when that dissolved, he said, or, or not Buck, but Sam Lavello, who was the producer of the I said, Janet, you need to call Jim Halsey in Tulsa. He's got a real good talent agency and Roy Clark among them. So I did, and I moved to Tulsa, and gosh, that was another milestone career. I heard clapping, I bet Yes, ma'am, I think yeah. Jenny Fricky's done. Yeah, I think, I think they're all done, probably. So that was, you know, I've had wonderful, and I still play classically. I play, I solo in orchestras, and I play lots of quartets, quintets, for fun. I'm doing a workshop uh, just the end of this month out in Palm, Palm Desert. And, uh, you know, I just love playing and love bringing that music to people and sharing with audiences like Buck showed me. And Roy continued. Roy was such a natural. Yes, ma'am. You know, he was a musician's musician and an outstanding musician, but also an outstanding showman. Yes, ma'am. And witty to the last breath. <laughs> even when he couldn't even hardly play anymore, couldn't walk. He got those audiences. He did conversation with Roy Clark for a while. And he got the audiences with him in the palm of his hand. He was a master. So uh, I, I feel blessed. I've been able to work with all these wonderful people, wonderful talents. And, uh, and I enjoy sharing. Yes, ma'am. Well, I remember watching you. Yeah. And uh, I remember it very vividly. Um, do you? Yes, absolutely I do. That's good. And so it was great to meet you, and thank you so much for telling your thank story. Thank you. And I think you need to write a book. Are you going to write it? <laughs> <laughs> I could ghostwrite it for you. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that. <laughs> that sounds good. Yeah. That's, thank you so much. Great to talk to you. You yes, too. Ma'am. So here's the corn from the set. Okay. There's the gray ghost. I gotta go get something to eat. Rudy has not. Uh, <laughs> you guys are great. Well, I used to drive a little bit. No, I don't. Howdy, howdy. Okay. Howdy. Hey there, how are you? Uh, better than I deserve. Yes, sir. Fish me down oh, well. late nine. Nice What's your night? Late in nine. Late in nine. I'm nice Ronnie. Nice to meet you. Diana, nice to meet you. Hey, Diana. Can we get a picture with you? Maybe? Sure. Oh, there's my guy. Yeah, I'm here, baby. <laughs> How are you, Ronnie? I'm, I'm uh, better, like, uh, better than I deserve. Yeah. So, Ready? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah,
Oh, and yet, the second time around, you went over to the house, so you're like, oh my gosh. Can I have it? I still have this shirt, and I've got the guitar and the shirt. I swear to God, it's about that little, and I thought, how in the hell was I ever that little? That does not surprise me. I gotta get back to sign those. How's, how's your favorite grandchild? Well, no, they're all my favorite. Stay out of trouble. that. Like a okay, favorite voice. Oh, they're all doing it. I know. I talked to Ronnie the other day. I'm in high So long, everyone. We'll see you next week on RFD TV. RFD TV. RFD TV. Ladies, if you're on the set in the in the first block, I need you out there. Okay, thank you. Was that us? Was that us? It's the I've got to do things I never even dreamed I'd get to do. I never will forget 1958. I'm at a little theater up in Franklin, Kentucky, and I lied to my daddy, and I'm eight years old. And I told my daddy, I said, Daddy, I said, Daddy, there's a monster movie on called King Creole. <laughs> well, he didn't have a clue. But see, I was already Elvis's biggest fan mm -hmm. since I was four. And so I went by myself, and for 50 cents, I got popcorn, I got a Coke, and I got in to see King Creole. And I sat there, and Elvis was 30 feet tall in black and white. That's the first time I'd ever seen him on a movie screen. And I was like, wow. And all of that music in influenced me so much. That's still my favorite soundtrack. He sang his favorite It was amazing. But, and that know, was his favorite mu movie as well. Yeah, but, but it's all those songs that were they were just so unbelievably well written. Yeah. You know, like, As Long As I Have You. Uh, all of those songs, my friend Ben Wiseman wrote two or three of them. Lieber and Stoller, of course, wrote King yes. Creo. But anyway, what if somebody had tapped me on my little eight-year-old shoulder and said, Hey, you see that guy up there? You're going to be his voice in movies. And do you see Scotty Moore? He's going to be your friend for 40 years. And DJ and the Jordanaires are going to be on your first number one record, Older Women Make Better Lovers. How could I have wrapped my mind with that? That's crazy. It is. It's amazing. It? Yeah. So I think about that a lot. Yeah. Amazing. And the theater is still there. Really? In Franklin, uh -huh. in Kentucky. Wow. Yeah. That's what she said. Sorry. Here we I'm trying to be straight. Which is a rarity. One, two, three. He, he walked right into that. I could not resist. Diana. Diana. That's how he is. I could not resist. I'm missing you too. I've seen you locally. And... Okay, children. Yeah. 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 And he wanted to, of course, he was with Scotty. One, two, three. Okay. Cheese. Cheese. Have you watched my videos? Well, man, I, I appreciate you watching. I love I've shared, the I've shared some of them. Have, yeah. Did you see Diana on there? I did you watch seen, her videos? He did um, mm -hmm. three, like a three-part on YouTube. Yeah, really. And it, 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 my book sales just 
Uh, yeah, I mean, she people dated started Elvis, you know, so. Oh, I know, yeah. I know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I got to get one of her books, too. Yeah. That was before I dated Elvis. Yeah. <laughs> See, so once you've been there, it's just hard to even talk about it. <laughs> okay, i got to ask you. I just asked Sandy this, and Sandy finally admitted it. Sandy Martindale. I said, Sandy, did you? Well, you're not filming me, are you? I am filming you. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, no, no. <laughs> One, two, three. I'm going to do one more. One, two, three. Oh, okay. Do you have any preference Thank you. Would you like to get you back on Thank you. So then is that just a defect? And you just have to do that? You know what's cool about that is that's still there. It is still there. And you know, what after, about what a historical place? Isn't it something? I mean, I think about all the records that I worked on in that place. I mean, that was like I said, my first session was called We Loretta, and I'm sitting there going, and I get here, you know. <laughs> and I never will forget one day over there. I had to, I had the best time. I met one of my heroes, and he looked just like he did in '56, Little Richard. He oh, was there. Oh my gosh, yeah. Yeah, he was. He walked in there, and I went. Wow, little Richard. And he goes, I can tell you're a man of God. <laughs> and he started, you know, preaching to me. I said, well, yeah, I, I believe in the Lord, but man, I sure do love all your records. He he said, well, I don't want to talk about those. I want to talk about the God, yeah. and, which was fine. Yeah. I was like, wow. Little yeah, it was Richard. surreal to see him. Yeah. yeah. I said, what a treat to see you. You too. Would love. Bob Lakeford and I were talking about you the other day. I hope half of it was all right. It's good. It's good. <laughs> we love Bob and Woodell and Corey, you know. That's just oh, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to watch your lips. I want to do that, too. I was in Birmingham with Marie Osmond and Jerry Reed. Now, tell me that's not a trio. That's a trio. Jerry Reed and Marie Osmond. And me and Jerry rode over in a separate car from Marie. And we was in the back of this car, and Jerry goes, uh, you want to hear my Elvis story? I said, Jerry, you know I'm Elvis' biggest fan. Well, we all know that Jerry wrote Guitar Man, among others, for Elvis. But anyway, he said, uh, I was fishing on Old Hickory Lake, and here come this boat. And he said, they was messing up my fishing. He said, this guy pulled up beside of me and said, Jerry, Elvis wants you to come and play on Guitar Man. He don't like the guy that's playing on it because he don't have the same feel. Well, we all know what a guitar player Jerry Reed was. And uh, so Jerry said, man, I flew down to Studio B and there he was. And he said, now Ronnie, I'm like you. I saw him in the movies, magazines, record albums, TV. He said, but I never laid eyes on Elvis Presley. He said, but I walked up to him and I looked at him like this. Then I walked over and looked at him like that. And then I looked at him like that. And he finally looked at me and said, hey man, you're making me uncomfortable. And Jerry goes, I can't help it, man. You're the prettiest I ever seen. <laughs> Sorry about the swearing, but that's what he said. <laughs> that's, that's Jerry Reed up and down, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and that's verbatim exactly what he told me. Awesome, man. But I, I've story. heard those stories like Robert Plant went up. He got to go up and see Elvis at the top of the Hilton, and Robert Plant, they, Led Zeppelin, they loved Elvis, idolized him like Paul McCartney. And Robert Plant walked up to him, and he goes, Hey, man, nobody should be allowed to look like you. <laughs> and, and I never will forget, I saw this, Paul McCartney on Larry King. I don't know if you've ever watched that. And Larry King goes, So, Sir Paul, who do you like? Do you like Frank Sinatra? And Paul goes, No, I like Frank. He said, well, who do you like? And he goes, Elvis. And Larry goes, Elvis? And he goes, yeah. He goes, hey, in England, we get it. Y'all don't get it over here. <laughs> and that's that's the coolest thing I've ever heard Paul say. That's very cool. Yeah. <laughs> but Paul, you know, he says that he can put, put uh, all shook up on just like me, and he feels like he's 15 again. And I get it. It's timeless, man. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, don't be cruel still sounds like rich cream. It does. It's not been touched. No, and when Elvis things. slapped on the back of that guitar, that is the most unbelievable sound in my ears. It's like a heartbeat or something. It's like he had an innate sense, an ISDJ. I said, how did he slap that and sing at the same? Looks like he'd be concentrating on his singing. And DJ goes, 
He could just do that. Like when Bill Black could not get Baby You're So Square on the electric bass, and he took the bass and threw it across, across the floor, Gordon Stoker told me, and said, Elvis picked it up and said, man, I can do it. And Elvis started playing, and that's Elvis you hear playing, you're so square, baby, I don't care. That's Elvis doing that. So this guy had an innate sense, didn't he? He did. He was incredible. Well, that's why Elvis was Elvis. Yeah, I mean, there's, there, there's Elvis and then there's everybody else. And that's exactly what <laughs> I say. Yeah. And that, that doesn't matter how high the the uh, stars are. It doesn't matter if it's Elizabeth Taylor, Rock Hudson. You name everybody that's ever been a star. But then you're right. There's Elvis and then there's all of them. And yeah. that's it. Period. It's amazing. And you can't really put your finger on it. You don't know why. I mean, you I know. can't I can't put my finger on why. Still, when I was four years old and I was listening to That's All Right Mama, and when my sister brought uh, Hound Dog and Don't Be Cruel in, and my mother got so mad because I played that Hound Dog over and over and over. And she finally said, you ain't going to listen to that no more. And when she left to go to work, I flipped it over, and there was Don't Be Cruel. And I went, I, and that's my favorite Elvis song, but it was also his favorite. That and It's Now or Never. And if you listen to It's Now or Never, and why in God's name that man did not get a Grammy for that vocal. It absolutely amazes me, but I do know why. It boils down to one word, jealousy. The industry was so jealous of that guy. Nobody ever looked like that, and nobody ever sang like that. And if you listen to It's Now or Never, there's never been a better, better vocal. Barry White, you remember Barry White? Barry White was in jail, he said. I heard his interview. He said, I was in jail. And he said, I heard it's now or never. And he said, that made me want to be a singer. And, of course, those scenarios have played itself out over and over and over. Look at Bruce Springsteen jumping over the gate, I mean the wall, to try to see Elvis. And the list goes on and on. It's amazing. And the thing is, is you're right, you know, from a standpoint of a Grammy, if you look at his body of work, and he never got a Grammy for only, regular stuff. Other only than his for Christian gospel, stuff, and right. to me that was a left-handed compliment. Not that his, when, he, when I was a kid, I thought Elvis was the only one that sang gospel music. That's a God's truth. And, I, and that's great that they gave him. But I mean, my God, the biggest selling record seller of all time, he didn't get any Grammy till he died. And now they give all... That's all right, Mama. Don't they gave them all Grammys? Yeah, they but should have given Grammys when they were deserved when he was alive. How did he not get an Oscar for "Can't Help Falling in Love with You" from Blue Hawaii? Are you kidding me? Yeah, it was just jealousy. Had to be. I mean, there's no other. That's it. That's it. It's just pure jealousy. Yeah. Hollywood was jealous of him. Nashville was jealous of him. It was just jealousy. He was cranking out. Hits one right after but the other. But guess who got the last laugh? He did. <laughs> Indeed, he did. <laughs> Thank you so much. Ryan. Thank you. Yes, sir. I hope I didn't wear you here. Oh, no, man. You're, you're great. So you're telling the story, and I'm sorry I interrupted you, but you were telling me the story about The King is Gone. Yeah. This was an iconic song after Elvis passed away. Very iconic. Um, in fact, I cried <laughs> when I heard it, and I bet a lot of other people did I cried too. too when I, I was 12, it. 13 years old, you know, I was when broken hearted. I, when I heard it on the radio, I know it's crazy, but I cried too. Yeah. That's God's truth. And I, I sang it, and I wrote it, and it still made me cry. But anyway, we so... We were talking about Gail Pollock, which Scotty called her his personal assistant. It was really his girlfriend. Uh, big time. Right. So... <laughs> and uh, so I had no earthly idea when I recorded The King's Gone that at uh, Studio 19 Music City Recorders, that Scotty Moore owned the studio. Now, that's a twist of irony, is it not? Indeed it is. And so the next morning, I flew down to Nashville, didn't sleep at all, because I wrote hot checks to pay for the studio, the tape, everything. It was $2,800. I had $40 to my name. And Lee Morgan, who helped me write the song, he walked out and said, you're going to have to pay for this. He just walked out. I had to, I wrote hot checks for the musicians, for the tape, for the studio, 
Do you know how much money that was? I mean, my That's heart. That's go to jail money. My heart at froze. That time. So I slept with that tape and I flew down to Monument Studios, which is still there in the little triangle where Scotty had his tape business. And I was sitting on the steps, those iron steps. I went by there last weekend, they're still there. And, and here come Gail. Unbeknownst to me, I didn't know Gail was Scotty's girlfriend and I'd been knowing her for years. And she never told me that. And so she said, Ronnie, what are you doing here? And I said, Gail, I want eight acetates made of this song. She said, what you got? And I said, I think I got a hit. And so she made me eight acetates. I wrote hot checks for those two. <laughs> and I went out to Wino Radio, little AM station in Madison. Why well, I went there. Now, another twist of irony, half a mile from Colonel Tom Parker's house. So I walked in and I said, would you play this? And this girl goes, well, we just don't do that off the street. And I said, well, it's about Elvis. Elvis' emotion was so high, she took it back to the DJ and there was a glass wall. I could tell he put that needle down on that turntable with that acetate. And he went like this, come here. And I went there and he said, you stand right here. I'm going to play this see if you get any reaction. And I was like, wow, thank you. It hadn't got a fourth into it and all of his phone lines lit up. And he goes, something's wrong with my phone. He goes, okay, okay. And he goes, man, this song ain't even over and they want to hear it again. And he never, he had to play it till I left there three hours later. Channel 5 come out, put me on the 5 o'clock news. It exploded. It was un It was like a movie. And then I went to the big rock station here in town. When I left there, I told them that story. And there was three guys in the hallway, and he looked at the ass tape. He went inside this little sound room. I could tell he was going to listen to it. And he did the same thing. He said, come here. He said, we're going to play this. Number one rock station. And he came back out three minutes later, and he goes, you have jogged our phone lines, jammed them totally. He said, you've got a smash. And that was it. Sold a million records in a week. Two weeks later, I was on American Bandstand, and Dick Clark and I became friends until he passed away. Incredible story. I got goosebumps to that. Did you feel that? <laughs> I've heard of him before. <laughs> wow. I'm thankful and honored to, you know. That's it's amazing to hear. Him. But, the, but now I didn't tell. I didn't tell you. Now, all I know you is by the spa guy. That's all right. I'm Billy the spa guy. Billy Stiles Billy. is my name. Well, Billy, <laughs> let me tell you this. Now, that was Friday, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Saturday, the record had exploded here in town, so they wanted me on a Grand Ole Opry. I didn't know this song. We, I threw it together. So I go out there, and I'm standing, and the Opry was, they were hanging from the Raptors. I was standing against the wall, tapping my foot, and I'm going, Lord, please let me remember this song. I didn't even know it. And Jim Ed Brown walked up to me, who, ironically, used to be on the road with Elvis in 54, him and his sisters. Mm -hmm. Elvis was in love with the youngest Brown sister. And then she One of the Brown him. sisters just passed recently. Yes, yes. Uh, Maxine's Maxine. still living. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so Jim Ed put his arm around me, and he said, Son, you're going to do fine. I said, Mr. Brown, I'm not afraid to sing. I just don't know this song. I just wrote it. He goes, when did you write it? And I said, two days ago. And he goes, two days ago? He said, well, good luck, son. <laughs> <laughs> but I want you to know, I went out there and I never missed a note. Not awesome. one syllable. But that wasn't the scariest part. Two weeks later, I'm on American Bandstand. Still didn't know this song that well. And Dick Clark come in the dressing room and he, I said, Mr. Clark, I'm so glad y'all pantomime because I've been watching you since 57. He said, Ronnie, we don't do that anymore. You got to sing it live in front of 80 million people. I said, please don't tell me that. He said, you'll have cue cards underneath the camera. But if you look at me on American Bandstand doing that song, I look like I was in total control. Like I knew what I was doing, but inside I was petrified. But I made it. That's amazing. Incredible story. I remember that song coming out and it just being uh, uh, unbelievable. Well, let me tell you the best part about that song, the best thing that happened. My mother had 11 of us, right? She worked three jobs trying to take... And so, Ronnie, uh, friends, unfortunately, my battery died. <laughs> so I didn't get the end of the story. So 
Uh, tell us about the impact that the King is Gone had on your mother. That Friday afternoon that the record broke, the one thing that I wanted to do was go tell my mother. And she had 11 of us, and she worked three jobs as long as I ever knew her. I don't know how she lived to be 66. But anyway, so I went up to Pure Truck Stop along the Kentucky-Tennessee border where she was mopping the floor. God's truth. And I walked in and I said, Mother, take your apron off. You don't ever have to work again. And she goes, Son, can't you see I'm working? And this truck driver was sitting on the cap by the counter. He said, Georgia May, don't you know what's going on with that boy? And she goes, No, nah, what? And uh, I said, Mother, come out to the car. This is the truth. And I turned the radio on, and The King is Gone was on every radio station. It, it never stopped. It, it was just like a movie. I couldn't have planned that. And my mother never worked again until she passed away, thanks to Elvis Presley. And The King is Gone. Amazing. That's an amazing story, Ronnie. But it's the truth. Hey man, congratulations on that hit. That was, uh, well, thank that you. was, it was perfect for the time. It was very timely. And well, timing is everything. Let me tell you how fate is a hunter. I got, when Elvis passed away that Wednesday, I flew down to Memphis. I stood in line at 8.30 in the morning. This is the God's truth. And I waited. I stood in line till 5.30, from 8.30 to 5.30. I got 10 feet from the gate and they closed it. I never saw Elvis alive or lying in state. So yeah. they started rioting. The, the news media didn't show what was going on. I mean, that place was, that place was. Okay, I'm sorry, I need to be on set. Okay. Thank you so much, Ron. Thank you. And I'll, I'll But anyway, the reason, I'll with you. the reason I was going to tell you about. No, sorry, oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah. Run this under your shirt and pull it out through there. Okay. Need to put that on there. I can do it. Bro, you got it. Did you put that mic back? Absolutely. Testing. She sent it to me this morning. Yep, that should be good. You're good. Okay. Hey, you're always happy. I love the hair. All right, so you were, so we were talking about fate before you had to run on I stage. Just, my friend Steve Jeppe, I was telling you about that owns uh, Baltimore Orioles. He, he said that to me. He said, fate is a hunter. And that's just one of the greatest things I've ever heard because... When I was standing in front of the gate after standing from 8.30 to 5.30, they shut it. People started rioting. I didn't want no part of that. So I left. Halfway between Nashville and Memphis, I turned the radio on. They opened the gate back up, and I was devastated. It was a three-and-a-half-hour drive back to Nashville. Yes. Probably four back then. Right. Well, no, yeah. I was in my 77 Camaro that okay. I rode to King is Gone. <laughs> so I was flying. But anyway, so when I got back at Scorpion Records office, here's Lee Morgan. He said, let's do a tribute to Elvis. And I said, Lee, I'm not wearing no jumpsuit. And he goes, that's not what I'm talking about. Listen to this song. I listened and I said, well, listen to what I wrote, which was, I was barely six years old when I first heard him sing. So we just combined them together. Now, had I gotten in to see Elvis lying in state, you know how long that would have taken? two or three hours because that line. Well, then Lee Morgan would not have been standing there. And so timing is everything and fate is a hunter. Love that. Fate is a hunter. Yes. Man, that's incredible. I, hey, uh, I'm going to tell you a story. In 1968, I'm a three-term combat veteran of the Vietnam War. We took a break from fighting. Me and Chuck Nietzsche and Joe Hedgepath I'd never sang in front of anybody in my life. And just before I stepped up on the makeshift stage in Vietnam, this old man grabbed my arm and he goes, 
Son, right where you're going to stay, stand, Elvis Presley stood there in 1956. And I said, yeah, right. What would Elvis be doing on this old ship? He said it was docked in San Diego, and he did the Milton Burrow show right where you're going to stand. And I'd never sang in front of anybody in my life. And you know what I sang? Well, when my blue moon turns to gold again. So I sang an Elvis song. And my life has just so been intertwined with Elvis, it absolutely amazes me. And then when I showed you that a while ago, my daughter called me and said, you know who Elvis's grandfather is? I said, well, yeah, I know everything. She said, no, you don't. So then when I punched in Elvis Presley's grandfather and it said Jesse D. McDowell, I was like, what the? It's and crazy. Then, and then I asked you about it. And yeah, then we start talking about it. Yeah, we did. And, and, <laughs> and I didn't uh, know she had done that. Well, I, I didn't either. Yeah. And so uh, um, my life just keeps in it. But I got to tell you this now, and then I'll uh, leave you alone. I was doing uh, the 60th anniversary of Elvis's passing with the Memphis Symphony. I was singing. On the show with me was uh, Scotty and DJ. And then Elvis's birthday. It was his 60th. birthday, yeah. Right. You're right. And so I was doing it with the Memphis Symphony. I got out of the shower. Scotty was in the door next to me at the Ramada Inn. And in soon Memphis? As, in Memphis. Okay. So, so when I were going to be at the Pyramid? Uh, no. Uh, we were, I forget where we where we were, at the Civic Center. Yeah, it would have been uh, Cook, which yeah. was where Ellis used to be. Right. That's where we were. And so I got out of the shower and that little voice on my shoulder said, look in the sink. And I looked in the, right on the side of the sink. There was nothing else on the sink around it. And there was two hairs. Now, we know how a hair will make a question mark. But on the side of that sink was two hairs and an E-P. And I, the hair stood up on the back of my neck. And so I went over and got Scotty. And I said, Scotty, you got to come over here and look at this. And Scotty come over and he looked down at them two hairs. And he goes, good God, get a camera. <laughs> and we took a picture of it. Is that not crazy? That is crazy. That's, that's interesting. So I have all kind of stories about how my life is intertwined and, you know, with uh, Scotty and DJ and June Juanico and uh, Louise Smith is one of my best friends in the whole world. She's amazing. I, like I told you, I interviewed her just a couple of weeks ago. And man, 86, yep. she sure And one of the only girls that Elvis ever turned down. Twice. I mean, turned Elvis, turned down, Elvis down. down. Now I need you guys. Okay, man. Sorry. Thank you, Ronnie. Hey, thank you. Yes, sir. <laughs> it's really good, Ronnie. Yeah, it turned out good. I was glad to be a part of it. Good to see you. You take care of yourself. I'll, I'll get you. Uh, contact me and I'll get you. Uh, hopefully she sticks with me. I hope so. I'll call you. I'll get you. I'll get you. Patty, his assistant, reached out to Jerry and said, Good to see you. And you sound good. Thank you. That's hard to do. Rock and pedal. But not for you. I can do it. <laughs> I've had to do so much. <laughs> Thank you, honey. Huh? Oh, no. I knew you would be. I see you, man. I see you. Appreciate you. I'll come by and see you. Sir. Absolutely. You need yeah. to do that. I'll do that. I have, um, I have something in my shop you probably want to see. Okay. You being an Elvis fan. I ain't made a video about it yet, but it's Yeah, like, I like watching the stories, but I, 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 I was one block or two blocks from two of his shows in Murfreesboro. He never went. Man, you should he never He never went. Yeah. Yeah. He's I was just one of those things. Yeah. Well, it's one of those things where uh, I saw ever since. I didn't like him to die. Yeah. And it's like others, too. I didn't like that person actor until they're gone. Yeah. Absolutely. Great to see you. Yes, sir. Stay in touch. So, friends, you. You all know Diana Goodman. Uh, she Hello. has done some other videos, and she invited me tonight to come to the. Uh, this is is this the beginning, and they're going to do a tour. Um, yes. Am I understanding that right? Mm -hmm. And this is kind of the beginning of the celebration, the 50th anniversary celebration of Yeehaw. This is just the kind of first run, and so we hope to do a lot of other things like this over the year. And I'm always so glad to see Billy, and I uh, appreciate everything that he does, and. Uh, it was, as we taped, I could look in the audience and see Billy's face, and he made me smile, so. <laughs> well, 
Well, thank you so much, Diane. Thank, thank you. you. It was, it was a privilege. You. And look, I, I made a lot of friends while I was here. So yes. I've been able to get some stories and all because of you. Yes, and we got to see uh, Ronnie McDowell. Yes, we did. Stay tuned. And um, Rudy Gatlin. Rudy. And um, let's see, who else? Oh, uh, um, Jamie Charlie, Charlie Pride, Charlie Jamie Freaky. Lee Greenwood. Lee Greenwood. Y'all better stay tuned. He's going to have some really cool videos coming up. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Oh, so it really is. Oh, it's going to be like a girl. Oh, oh, girl. Hey. I got you. 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 I All right, friends. So there it was the reunion. Jump in my trusty steed and go home.